Okay, good evening. Welcome. I call to order the March 19th, 2015 meeting of the City of Bellingham Planning Commission. I respectfully ask that all in attendance please take a moment to ensure that all electronic devices are silenced for the duration of tonight's meeting. Heather, if you could please call roll. Phyllis McKee. Here. Tom Grinstead. Here. Garrett O'Brien. Here. Steve Crooks. Here. Cerise Noah. Here. Ali Taishi and Jeff Brown have been excused. Okay, we don't have any minutes from uh, previous meetings to approve, so we'll open the public comment period. This is an opportunity for those in attendance that wish to speak on anything that's not related to tonight's proposal, uh, an opportunity just to spend a few minutes and address the commission. Okay, I see that we don't have any takers for that, so um, we will... Uh, we will uh, begin the presentation and discussion of the uh, proposed rezone request and amendment to the Samish neighborhood plan. Uh, several stakeholders have uh, submitted written comments and public written comments prior to tonight's meeting, which have been reviewed by both the commission and city staff. Um, public testimony will be heard this evening and entered in the record during the public comment period. Uh, at the conclusion of tonight's meeting, the Planning Commission may move to adopt the findings, facts, and conclusions and make a recommendation to City Council. The uh, Planning Commission will be considering the rezone decision criteria and the criteria for a comprehensive plan amendment, as outlined in the staff report. I believe the applicant was wishing to present first, so if you could please state your name and address for the record. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay. Uh, Scott Swanson, Belcher Swanson Law Firm, 900 DuPont Street. Uh, first off, thanks for the opportunity to present. I represent the applicant for this proposal, which is uh, Ashley Street Properties, LLC. Uh, two of the representatives are here today. Uh, my client owns property uh, in Area 1. I'm going to work on getting a map up here, so bear with me for one second. If I hit this button, uh, great. So it's um, it's an area one of the Samish neighborhood. The property is the eastern 1.6 acres of area one. So it's the ha the hashed area up in the, the it says subject area there. Um, it abuts Ashley Avenue and is generally north of Byron Avenue, uh, east of the Lincoln Creek Transportation Center, and south of the. Perfect. Do Thanks, Kathy. So the, the, this is the subject property right here. The property is currently zoned commercial auto. Uh, the auto designation restricts the use of property to auto designated uses only. Um, I'll go into that in, in more detail. Uh, but my client's proposal is to request a comprehensive plan amendment and rezone of the property. The specific proposal is to change the zoning from commercial auto to commercial planned. The auto is, is just the wrong use qualifier, but the zoning designation commercial uh, is, is appropriate. The simple change in the use qualifier will allow the property to be developed with additional use types, you know, mainly multifamily with a small commercial component. Uh, your role as was stated earlier, is to uh, make a recommendation to the City Council, and the criteria are found at BMC 20.20.040 and BMC 20.19.030. Uh, one of the disadvantages of going first is I, I don't know exactly what staff's going to go through and, you know, vice versa. So, but the staff report does it go specifically through the criteria, so I'm going to leave some of that to staff's presentation and to the report, but I do plan on hitting a few of the high points. Uh, staff has provided a thorough analysis of the criteria and they've identified facts that this criteria have been met. Um, we believe staff has done a good job and we agree with the staff's analysis. Uh, one, one thing about the staff's proposal I wanna point out is going back to the subject area again, uh, it's all in area one right now Staff's proposal is to create a new area 1A in the Samish neighborhood. 
uh, and we're fine with that proposal. Um, to be clear though, the, the property is already zoned commercial. It just has this auto designation. Um, the auto qualifier was put on this property many years ago and is not appropriate anymore. Um, I'll go into more detail on this, but I think it's simply to say the vicinity has significantly changed and the auto use qualifier does not make sense. Uh, it's unlikely a motel or fast food restaurant would ever be constructed on this site. Um, even if one were to be developed, you know, is it desirable to do so? Uh, the, I'll briefly go into the existing neighborhood. And I'm going to switch maps here. Let's see if I can. So this, this is an aerial photo of the existing neighborhood, and you'll see that it's primarily developed with a mix of single and multifamily residential uses. So the single family is up in this area. We've got multifamily over here um, and over here. See, the, the exception is the transit facility, which is located generally right here, and then the office building, which is down here on the corner of uh, Lincoln Street, abutting Lincoln. Um, the, the rezone is consistent with this, this neighborhood. Um, I do have another map to show you, which is the, here's a map of the current uses. So you can, again, it just shows what was, what's, what's currently, currently there. I'm now going to turn to just address some of the criteria, uh, which you know are found in the staff report. But the first criteria is the proposal must be consistent. This is a comprehensive plan amendment criteria. I'm going to work off of, and the proposal must be consistent with Growth Management Act and other applicable laws. Uh, the staff correctly points out that a number of GMA planning goals are met. You know, one of the most important is of course, is to encourage development in urban areas where adequate public facilities and services exist. Uh, this property is served by existing public facilities and services already. Um, the property has been zoned as it currently is for over 30 years and there's been no development. Uh, the rezone would facilitate an expanded list of permitted uses, you know, which would open up the opportunity for development of an in infill site, you know, which you know, is consistent with the Growth Management Act. Again, it's, it's in close proximity to the transportation center. Um, so it's, a, a, it's development of a longstanding infill site. Another goal is to, is to encourage availability of affordable housing to all economic segments of the population, promote a variety of residential densities and housing types. You know, again, we believe that this, this does that by opening up the residential use of this property. Uh, Finally, it reduces the inappropriate conversion of undeveloped land into sprawling low density development. Um, this really is a, a prime target for you know, multifamily development and density, and, and it meets the, it's not only consistent with the GMA, I believe it's mandated by the GMA. This is infill development. Another one of the criteria is changing in circumstances, changing community values, and is consistent with and will help achieve comprehensive plan goals and policies. The Samish Neighborhood Plan was adopted in 1980. This was prior to GMA and citywide planning um, supporting infill. So the staff details the fact that there's been two rezones that have occurred in the area. That one is the area 20 right here. This was, this was rezoned from commercial auto to, to commercial planned and is now a multifamily uh, has a multifamily component to it. Um, this is, so it is consistent with the existing uh, development in the neighborhood. Um, there's been significant change with the establishment of the, you know, the large transportation center, the adoption of the Samish Way Urban Village, and the adoption and the delay of construction of San Juan Boulevard are all factors that have kind of had this this area has developed the way it has. Uh, this area is going to continue to change, but one thing is clear, the auto designation does not make sense. You know, the planned use qualifier provides the opportunity for multifamily development, which the auto qualifier does not. Um, uh, residential, just residential uses are not permitted at this time. 
In addition, the staff correctly points out a number of comprehensive plan goals and policies regarding infill and development of vacant land. Uh, this rezone will facilitate those goals. I'm not going to go through those. Those are in the staff report, but let's just say we agree. Uh, another criterion is it will result in long-term benefit to the community and is in the community's overall best interest. Uh, again, it's, you know, multifamily uses which aren't allowed, uh, I think, is a, is a, is a long-term benefit. It's going to foster infill development. The final criteria, other than meeting the rezone criteria, is it will not adversely affect the public health, safety, or general welfare. Um, this, this criteria has been met. The area is already served with public utilities, you know, sewer, water, et cetera. Uh, it's been vacant for a number of years. Um, it will help provide the housing and needed housing and residential uses developed will be consistent with the area. And again, the future development impacts will be addressed by city code mitigation as applicable through the planned process as that's what's being proposed. I'm not gonna go through the, the rezone criteria as if you look at them, they're pretty, pretty similar to the comprehensive plan amendment criteria. Uh, so it'd be kind of repeating a lot of the same things. I mean, there, there are some high points in there and maybe staff will, will address some of those. Uh, there has been a neighborhood meeting and public comments have been submitted, which you've all seen. I want to address some of the specific concerns that have been raised in those public comments at this time. The first is traffic. Um, traffic is an issue that's come up in just about every public comment. Um, and to address this, we hired Transpo Group, uh, a, a traffic engineering firm, to prepare a traffic impact assessment. Um, basically just comparing conceptual projects. Uh, one was a 75 unit apartment building, just a concept, and the other was uh, commercial development that could be done under current zoning. And, and the report found that, you know, the conceptual residential project of 75 units is anticipated to generate 50 trips during the weekday peak hour, while, which is 63 fewer weekday peak hour trips than will be generated by typical commercial retail development allowed under the current zoning. So the impacts of a residential development on traffic are significantly less, and there really is no concern at all with regards to traffic. The intersections were studied. The uh, little, if any, of the traffic would distribute to the east, which is where the residential, you know, the residential area up here, one of the late, large concerns you keep hearing about is the traffic merging that way. The, the, the report found it wouldn't. Um, so if you look at the data, the concerns raised by the public comments are, are, are just not, they're, they're unfounded. So next I'm gonna to turn to parking, which is also one that, that raised significant comment. The parking code requires adequate parking on site for future development. The parking will be addressed as part of the planned permit process. As I, as I said earlier, the, the, basically there will be another bite at the apple. I will say that it's worth noting, you know, my client typically over parks their projects. Um, it's unlikely that parking will be behind the buildings towards, I mean, it's, a, the, it's, it's likely that parking will down be below behind the buildings. The buildings would be pushed up on Ashley Street. There's a lot of space down there for parking in it, and it, you know, so in terms of impacts, again, it won't be known until a project's actually proposed, but looking at the site constraints and things, it's likely that everything will be pushed down that direction. Um, so the, the plan designation provides that opportunity, though, for that to be addressed. And I mean, there is a transportation center right there. That a lot of people could opt to simply not have cars because that transportation facility is there, which is, a, I think, a huge point and one that can't be dismissed easily. So uh, the next is going to be a density is, is something you'll hear about or have heard about in the public comments, um, basically arguing that this is not appropriate for multifamily development. Uh, there are, You've seen some, some advocate for the akin to the infill, infill toolkit or you know, similar uses that are appropriate for this site. Um, it's simply unfounded and is, is, is a down zone of this property. Um, the, the project site is ideally situated for higher density, uh, more so than other properties in the city. Uh, it's close to the transit center and a transit corridor. It's not just transit center, it's a go line. Everybody can get around the city very easily. Um, it was a public 
policy decision to centralize the transit location there. Uh, we think it was a good decision, helps reduce carbon footprint, all the reasons that we want to try to centralize those things, reduces travel time, means less cars on the road, all those benefits. But it's appropriate to, to locate multifamily housing in areas where you've got these transportation centers. Um, so again, it's an un, undeveloped infill site, fully serviced, transportation's there, expanding the use to residential on this property is just, it's, in, it's within character of the neighborhood. I mean, you can, you can see everything around here is all, is all similar type uses. Um, I would point out that the Ashley Street and the Creek, I can probably get a better picture here, create a natural buffer between the proposed development and the residential area where you're hearing the concerns come from. Um, turning now, there are some, some issues regarding critical areas that were addressed in the comments. Um, I'd argue that it's not the time to be talking about critical areas because that would come up in the plan development permit. That said, a critical area review has been done on the site. I think it was included in your packet as part of our application. The development will be avoiding the creek. Uh, there's no wetlands. The geological issues of the slope can be mitigated, so there's no other crit critical areas beyond that. Um, finally, I want to be clear that this is not student housing. This is not a dedicated student housing facility that you've heard so much about. You know, this project, the project my clients are considering, is intended to create housing for all segments of the community, um, students, elderly, single parents, et cetera. Uh, but, it's, you know, there will be students here, and there should be students here. There's a parking center there. So, I mean, I, I, we're not going to say there won't be students, but it is not being built, you know, as a student-type housing facility. This is built for the community. It'll be a, you know, nice project. Sorry. So, I guess I, I'll conclude in, just by saying that this is an opportunity to implement what GMA has mandated. Um, it's really a simple change of expanding uses in, in an existing zone. The rezone would allow development of residential property, you know, infill and vacant parcel, um, abutting the transportation facility. It's, it's what GMA is all about, and this needs to be encouraged. Uh, the criteria and rezone, a comprehensive plan may have been met. Uh, I urge you to adopt the findings of fact and conclusions. Uh, I really appreciate your consideration. I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys might have, but that's it for, for my presentation. So. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Kathy Bell's the staff contact for this proposal. Kathy, you have a presentation for us? Go back to the uh, PC podium. Thank you, Kathy Bell Planning. Um, I agree with Scott. I believe the staff report is thorough in addressing the decision criteria that the Planning Commission um, must consider this evening to determine if the applicants have met the burden of um, complying with those criteria. I do briefly want to go over some points since there is some information that was submitted after the staff report uh, was issued. 
Um, the first, just uh, in summary and for clarification, this is a comprehensive plan amendment and rezone. Um, I would like the planning commissioners to, um, if they didn't get it from the staff work, is to at least be aware that the reason it is a comp plan amendment is in the neighborhood description right now for sub area one, it says that the uses shall be limited to auto commercial. That is very odd in what we have done that potentially was an oversight when we took all development regulations out of the neighborhood plans and put them into the land use ordinance. Nevertheless, it's in there. So in order to rezone any portion of this property or to have it under any other designation other than auto commercial, it requires a neighborhood plan amendment. We are also proposing, as uh, Mr. Swanson stated, that for simplicity is creating a new sub area, area 1A, and that is not inconsistent with what you will see further to the south where there is an area um, that was rezoned from commercial to residential multi-planned and it's now area 2A. And the rezone is essentially to remove the auto use qualifier and to allow the planned use qualifier. And in page 65 of the packet is what staff put together as a permitted use matrix. And the intent there was to show what uses are permitted in planned commercial, which are allowed in auto commercial, and therefore it shows which are allowed in both, which would no longer be permitted under the plan designation, and those which would be permitted that are not currently permitted. And we, I don't believe that we need to go through this. Obviously, the one that is of most discussion and public comment and also presented by Mr. Swanson is that under planned commercial residential uses are permitted, where in auto commercial they are not. There are other uses as well, but I think that's the one that's been most highlighted this evening. Because it is both comp plan amendment and a rezone, um, staff is wanting to remind the planning commissioners that they are to make sure that the decision criteria for both the comprehensive plan amendment and the rezone are met. As stated um, by Mr. Swanson, there is not a specific development proposal before us. This is simply um, a proposal to have a different zoning designation. There already is a commercial comp plan designation, so this is to allow a different land use designation. Um, and all impacts associated with a specific development proposal will be reviewed at that time. Staff has done enough analysis based upon the existing um, traffic considerations at the intersections and to look at view issues, clearing issues, all of those that are typically um, special conditions in our zoning table. And we've also looked at any major um, capital improvements in the area that may be needed and none were identified. So that's why when you look to the rezone ordinance, the, what staff is um, wanting to present to city council, you will see a lot of nuns. And that is because we now have development regulations that actually take care of a lot of the issues that are special conditions and prerequisite considerations. So in this particular case, under a plan designation, we have the ability to require frontage improvements. We have the ability to limit access. We have the ability through the critical area ordinance to address the critical areas that are on site and in the vicinity. The critical area ordinance also allows us to deal with steep slopes. So we no longer need to place those as special conditions or prerequisite considerations because we have codes now that deal with those. Where back in 1980, under the old form, we didn't have a lot of those codes in place. Staff believes that the proposal is consistent with the comp plan amendment and rezone um, criteria, just some of things that we'd like to highlight is the proposal would allow uses that are um, similar to those in the area. If residential is developed on this site, residential uses are permitted to the north, they exist to the east, and they are permitted to the south. And as you will see in area two of the planned commercial, um, there is 
that is predominantly developed with residential, but it does have a very small commercial component in each of those residential um, developments. And that is what our code allows. There is no um, proportion or amount of commercial that has to go with a residential development in the plan designation. The, to the existing topography lends well to a mixed use development. Um, typically, you'll see autocentric uses are on flat land, those that have high visibility on arterials. Um, this is not that. So with commercial development, the question is, is it really suitable for that? And we do know at least that the Lincoln Professional Center, which is at the corner of Lincoln and Byron, there is vacant commercial space in there. There's a brand new mixed use development just north on Lincoln Street that has vacant commercial on the street side. The apartments have filled up. Um, so there's a question of demand and a question of supply. And this area has not developed like that on the west side of I-5 that had similar zoning, which was auto commercial. And a big reason for that probably is because that's where the old highway ran through and that was the route that people took. When we did the urban village for Samish, we did get rid of all the auto zoning and we made it an urban village. Area one is really what is left of, and area 21, which is left of the auto designation. And while the intent in the zoning says it is for auto-centric, it does recognize that not every area can develop with just the auto-centric uses, and that's why you see a broader range of permitted uses um, in the use matrix than just the drive-throughs, the gas stations, those types of uses. Uh, the other that Mr. Swanson noted is that it is located near a transit center, and that is something that did not exist to the prior considerations. Um, and or when the auto centric or the auto commercial designation was placed on this. Uh, the last thing I'd like to add is um, allowing residential development in this area is a good planning policy and it provides a natural buffer of higher density residential um, that will buffer the commercial uses in the future should those, uh, should the uh, transit center ever redevelop to something other than what it is. The density that is to the east is a 5,000 square foot density and this does provide that buffer and that transition. Similar to area 2A, which is just south of this, that has a density range of 1,500 to 4,000 as well. So not only does Lincoln Creek provide a physical barrier um, or buffer, but we also have the opportunity through zoning to provide that transition as well. So now going towards the information that was submitted um, after the staff report was issued, one is the traffic study. And the, the clarification that I want to make or the point I want to make is that with comp plan amendments and rezones, there is not a current requirement within our development standards that requires submittal of a traffic study. So this was done on the owner's behalf to demonstrate and to respond to the comments that were received. We do do a traffic study with specific development proposals that create more than 50 p.m. peak trips. So the chances are most likely that whatever is developed on this site will need a traffic study at some point in time. We will evaluate uh, what the impacts are from that development and then apply proper mitigation as necessary once we know the specific um, developments. We have been doing a lot of um, analysis in this area for given all the different projects that are there from University Ridge to Campus Crest, which are purpose-built student housing proposals that are really quite different than standard multifamily. Um, but we've also recently presented and received approval for grant funding that will put sidewalks on Lincoln Street fronting the entire transit center. So there's been a lot of work in the area. We have a general idea um, based upon the capacity of how the area could develop. And we've identified that there are needs in this area and we were able to get that grant for those pedestrian um, facilities. So that, that was a great opportunity for the city of Bellingham. 
Um, going specifically now to the public comment, which I believe all planning commissioners have received this green packet and um, both Heather and I verified that those are all the public comments that we received to date. Um, so it was consistent amongst both of us. Um, some of the issues, I won't reiterate what um, Mr. Swanson talked about, but some of what was talked about was um, neighborhood character. There's a lot of social issues that are raised in the public comments when it comes to noise, trash, parties, those types of things. Um, loss of habitat and conservation easement. Um, so some environmental. The neighborhood character, um, it is predominantly residential in the area and there are services there for residential uses, one being the transit center, um, the other are some personal services. And you do have multifamily that are on the western edge of both the Puget and the Samish neighborhood in this um, vicinity. And when we have reviewed other projects in the area, predominantly the major, the major concern that was raised during those public comment letters are the single family residences and the lack of management. Um, the existing multifamily apartment buildings, they weren't highlighted as significantly as a single family. I'm not gonna say that there weren't issues with them or there aren't, but clearly it's the single family homes that are raising the issues um, of having a lot of um, you know, on street parking, noise, parties, trash, all of the social issues that were brought up in the public comments. Um, there were also some comments about loss of habitat and conservation easement. What I want to show you What I want to show you on this map um, specifically is what we have been able to establish through both our wetland and stream ordinance, which was in the early 90s up until now, what we're also doing um, under our critical area ordinance. And Lincoln Creek flows through this area right here. And the reason that I bring that up for importance is that you can see the corridor that Lincoln Creek has established. We certainly intend to keep that corridor as it goes over Ashley onto the northern portion of this site. Um, one of the other things, if you went out to visit the site, which I hope you did, is this stretch of Lincoln Creek has been restored. And that is one of the things that we're trying to do. Um, while this picture doesn't show it, but up in this area, that's where the Campus Crest, um, actually at CA Ventures now, are gonna be developing a purpose-built student housing. And again, there will be preservation through the Creek Corridor through there. So we're recognizing and understanding clearly that there's a resource there that needs to be protected. Um, and it is more likely than not, I can't say it'd be required because we don't have land use applications, but that there will be a conservation easement over the critical areas on site with any development proposal that comes on this property, regardless of the use. So there's a portion of the creek and there's some offsite wetlands, but the buffers from the creek and the wetlands as well extend further onto the site and those would be placed in a conservation easement. So we would be continuing to add to the um, efforts that the city has been employing over the years. One of the other things I want to bring up, while it's, it's an issue that can be debated, there's no doubt, um, but that's traffic and parking. Um, and I'd like to specifically respond to parking. Um, there were a lot of photos that were submitted showing the on-street parking and the lack of demand that um, all the existing residents are, are doing to take up all the available on-street parking. In talking to our transportation planner and some of the other city staff, um, what is identified with on-site parking is that it's the most efficient form of parking that we can provide. One, that's an existing impervious area that's already there. But more importantly, it's usually transient parking. People come and go and it opens available spaces on demand. And it just allows for visitors to come and go and you know it's open to the public. Um, the other is it is a, it is a traffic calming 
um, measure typically, and, and they do studies on this kind of stuff all the time, that if there are cars on the road on, parked on the side, you will drive slower than in a road that is, say, 36, 36 feet wide. But if you park two rows of cars on each side, the human behavior, you will drive slower. So there's a traffic calming effect to that. The other is that um, they've, they've done studies for how people feel. And people who are on pedestrian facilities that have an automobile between them and the travel lane, they feel safer because they know they have a buffer. They're not immediately right there next to cars you know, driving right by them. So on street parking, while it may have its aesthetics, it's not a bad thing. And um, there are good attributes to that as well from a, from a planning perspective. So in closing, um, again, I'd like the Planning Commission to keep in mind that zoning is an opportunity. There's nothing here that is forcing them to develop this property with any specific use. There's a range of uses that are allowed. Um, Again, public comment has talked a lot about the desire to do residential, but under plan commercial, there are other opportunities that there um, that the zoning would allow. I would like to also draw your attention to um, the rezone ordinance that is in your packet and that there was a conscious effort made for area 20 in the Puget neighborhood, which is immediately north of this, to allow residential outright in a planned commercial zone, which is also similar to a decision that the Planning Commission made on Samish Highway as well. So we have presented our recommendation to you um, to accept the applicant's proposal. We believe that they have met the comp plan amendment and the rezone criteria. We have also included in our staff recommendation that should the Planning Commission wish to allow residential as outright permitted uses, then, then staff would um, agree with that recommendation, but we would need to go back and to amend our findings because they do not include those at this time, and we would also need to amend the draft rezone ordinance that is included in your packet for consideration. So with that, in my final conclusion, staff does recommend that the Planning Commission approve the proposal, and that is to amend the Samish Neighborhood Plan by adding a new sub-area, area 1A, with a commercial designation, and to amend the Samish Neighborhood Table of Zoning Regulations to add a new sub-area 1A with a commercial plan zoning designation. And if you have any questions. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, before we get into the public comment period, are there any just quick clarifying questions from the commission? Yes, Phyllis? Kathy, could you go back and, and restate what you just said about uh, if the decision were to allow residential? There, were, you kind of went through that very quickly, and, and uh, can you just clarify that statement? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Okay. So currently, right now, under plan commercial, residential is permitted only. Um, only when another primary permitted uses is developed as well. So what that means is that, for example, they could open um, a commercial, a permitted commercial use within the same building that they have a, the residential uses. It's called a mixed use development. And the zoning requires that. What is different about another recommendation that came from the Planning Commission on one of the other Samish proposals that came before you um, a few months ago and area 20 of the Puget neighborhood is they allow residential outright, meaning you do not have to do a, a permitted commercial use together with the residential use. But so it's permissible. My, what's that? But it's permissible. It would be if it was specifically adopted that way. Otherwise, in order to do residential, you have to perform or to establish another permitted use. You cannot have residential as a standalone Better. use in plan commercial. But it doesn't stop one from being able to develop commercial as well as residential. So by saying correct. they could do residential as mm -hmm. well, it just broadens it, not narrows it. That's correct. Got it. Yes. Any other questions before we get public comment? Tom? Yeah, I have a, a question. Um, where, where did the 75 unit apartment density come from? Is that off the, the, the table or? Where are you getting the 75 unit apartment from? Um, 
right off of the traffic this. study. Again, I mean, I can let the applicant mm -hmm. respond to that, but I believe what the applicant said is that they just threw out some two proposed developments for what they are. I mean, the commercial development could have been more, could have been less, the residential could have been more, and it could have been less. But it, um, that's certainly a question that you could ask the applicant as well. We'll have a We'll have a, an opportunity to, to clarify that after we, if there's any other questions. If the applicant wants to respond to that question, that, that'd be great. I would just like to make one more comment. Right down the street from that is where we have the, the residential as well as the mandated, mandated um, commercial areas, and those commercial areas are vacant, still vacant, have been for quite some time. So I have really mixed feelings about requiring somebody to put in something that there seems to be no demand for it, and let it be an option rather than a demand that one has to do that. I'm sure it was a great vision at the time somebody came up with the idea, but it doesn't seem to be working. Those are good good questions. We'll have an opportunity to discuss that more. I think I'd like to open the public comment period, and then uh, then we'll have the applicants a quick uh, opportunity and staff an opportunity to respond to any questions or clarifications that come up. So we had two speakers speak uh, sign up, uh, Mr. Connerboy and uh, Mr. Abel. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Yeah. Uh, well, just four minutes for the comment period. Uh, please yeah, state your you name and one one back one. Up. Yeah. Okay. name and address for the record. Thank you. It doesn't count. Okay. It's a staff <laughs> How's that? That's wonderful. Thank you. Hi. My name is Dick Conaboy. I live on South 46th Street uh, in the Samish neighborhood. I'm on the Samish board, but I am not speaking for the board tonight. Um, back in, uh, I think it was 2004, there was an attempt to rezone this to uh, multifamily residential, and it was defeated, essentially because there was really no telling what was going to go on this property, what size apartment unit. And we're up against that again here. Uh, back then, it was a 60-unit apartment building with 100 parking spots. But in the pictures uh, that you find in your packet, the ones that Kathy referred to, you'll see that right across the street from this are these four snout houses, which are uh, overpopulated rentals with 20 to 25 cars. Uh, every other spot that's available uh, in all directions of the compass from this lot are taken up on the roadway. Now, it's very good to say that, well, people are gonna come and go and whatnot, but weekends around that area are not a picnic. Now, I invite anybody who wants to enjoy that to go buy a house in that area. I went and checked each one of the houses on the 40, 41st, 42nd, 43rd, et cetera. It's in, in the notes that I gave you. 36% of those single family homes are now rented. That place is turning into what might be ter termed a student ghetto. The fact that the propo proponents say that we can get young families and couples to move into this whatever co apartment complex they're putting up there I think is a pipe dream. All they have to do is pull up to the front yard and look across the street and see the horror show in those four snout houses. So the circumstances have changed in this area and they've changed for the worse. I wouldn't mind entertaining something there that was limited in size. But the problem is, once this is rezoned, it can be built out to the max without public hearing. And correct me if I'm wrong, staff can try, it turns into a different type of process. So the cat's already out of the bag, and the neighborhood has bought a pig in a poke. And I don't think that's a good thing to ask of the neighborhood. And I would like to see the infill toolkit put in here. I'd like to see duplexes. Just to the south of this on Ashley, there's a row of, it looks like duplexes. I'm pretty sure it's duplexes. 
and uh, uh, I think it's uh, there's a um, right here. It would be a fine place to put some more of those. It would limit the no number of cars. It would limit the, the num number of people. So I'd like you to care carefully consider uh, rezone on this without putting some limitations on the on the size of whatever can go up there. And if if you can't limit the size, then I would uh, tell the developers go back to the drawing board and ask for something else. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Abel. <clears throat> Heather, I'm Steve Abel at 1021 34th Street. I had never heard the term snout houses before I came to Bellingham, but I did live in Iowa for 22 years where there are more hogs than people, so I know what snouts look like. It's a kind of a graphic description of the houses that are across the street from this property. Um, I'm not opposed to all development on this site. Uh, I am having a problem with what might turn out to be the density, the number of people who will live on this property. Uh, one of the classic techniques that a good magician uses is misdirection. He misdirects the audience's attention to one hand while the other hand is performing the trick. Uh, and while I appreciate the applicant's commitment to the project to commission a traffic study, I know those things don't come cheaply. I don't think the traffic study has much meaning in this case because it compares an untenable set of developments which is a, a 16,000 square foot retail space, a 5,000 square foot restaurant, and a gas station. I'm not a developer myself, but as I look at the map and think about where that property is, it doesn't make much sense to me to put those three items in that space because it's pretty far out of the main drag, pretty far away from where most of the traffic is. The comparison is made between that hypothetical development and a 75 unit apartment project. That's misdirection. What I would really prefer your direction to be aimed at is, what is this small corner of Samish neighborhood now? And what will it be if, seven, if a 75 unit apartment building is dropped in there? It's fair to think that most of the residents of a building like that will be college students. There's an awful lot of them in this area. I have nothing against college students, but they create kind of a unique environment that will not be very attractive to older couples, to retirees, to young couples with children, to working couples. So once that building starts to fill up, it's going to be college students. And I think all that will do is aggravate the existing problems in that area, parking, noise, let's face it, drunkenness, litter, uh, issues surrounding party houses. And I think the extent to which those problems will be exacerbated is roughly proportional to how many people live on this piece of property. So while I'm not opposed to development in this area, I would sure like you to take a really hard look at how many people are likely to live in whatever buildings get constructed there and compare the current situation in the neighborhood, as you saw clearly in Dick's pictures with parking issues, and as you've heard from neighbors who wrote letters citing issues with trash and beer cans and parties going on Friday and Saturday night, and see what happens to that part of the neighborhood if 100 plus college students move into that property. I just don't think that will be healthy for the neighborhood, uh, and I just, don't think that's what you ought to allow to happen there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if the applicant would like to speak to, uh, there was a question by Commissioner regarding uh, the units. Mr. Chairman, you should probably ask if there's anybody else. Oh, thanks. Yeah. And it, if we, you didn't sign up, you there, still there, have an there, there is additional people here this evening that, that didn't sign up. Is there anybody who wishes to speak who, uh, who did not sign up on the sheet? Thank you. Please just state your name and address for the record. Good evening, I'm Erwin Lloyd. I live at 1005 Kelly Ridge Court. 
Um, my comments would be similar to Mr. Abel's in, in many respects in that I would just encourage you to consider a, a somewhat lower density um, as I just think it would be uh, better for the whole neighborhood and uh, I think Mr. Abel made some good comments and, and I would just encourage you to consider that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, anybody else like to speak? All right. Mr. Swanson, if you'd like to respond. Uh, thank you. So it, the, in, in regards to, I think there were, were two questions. Um, the first was regarding the traffic report and where the 75 units came from. Uh, engineers really like to have a project and they can't do findings without. So we, we basically tried to get a report with you know, various uses and hypotheticals and all kinds of things that you could look at, evaluating what various projects would, I mean, various situations would look at. They didn't like that. So the best thing we could do was to you know, ask them to do two, you know, and like we said in the letter, they're hypothetical projects, but to evaluate those exact projects with exact figures, so at least you have something to compare side by side. That's how we came up with the 75 unit. It really, you know, was just that, so. So, so it's not based on any density. Um, it's, it's not, but I mean, it is something that there could, you know, you could potentially do 75 units. Uh, again, I, I think it, it, it goes into Mr. Abel's comments regarding his problem with, with density. Uh, density, it's not as easy as just slapping 75 units or 100 units or whatever they think is gonna go there. It's, you know, while we don't have exact figures, there's setback requirements, there's, there's a height restriction, and I mean, maybe Kathy can, can assist on this a little bit, but then the parking requirements, it really restricts a site. It's, I mean, it is only 1.6 acres. You're not gonna be able to put, you know, a ton of units. I mean, 75 may, you know, very well likely is possible, but we, we don't know that yet until we, we hire the right professionals, you know, architects, engineers, et cetera, to put together the package. But, you know, that was, so is it likely a 75 unit one could go there? I, we think probably, but we, we don't know until going forward, so. And again, there's no proposal on the table at this point, so I wanna make that clear with the traffic report. It wasn't a proposal, it was just, to, to put, it was a good comparison to use, so. Are there any other questions to clarify the testimony that we heard, the public comment that we heard? You, Tom? Kathy, um, do you know offhand what the density for um, whatever that thing is, Maple Glen or Maple whatever? You, Maple Park Apartments? That's it. Um, we can, I can find that real quick. I mean, I can log on and we can find that. But I don't, I mean, I don't know offhand. I know what the single family is, and that's zone multifamily plan, 5,000. But they've pretty much developed it off single family. But um, I can find that. I was just wondering for, you know, some kind of comparison. But that's fine. <clears throat> Phyllis? Okay, uh, Kathy. Um, so with this change, the proposed change, a proposal that will come in the future that would include residential. How, um, what safeguards are there there to assure the people of, that have concerns that their worst nightmare is not coming down the pike? I mean, do they have to go through application process where those things are evaluated at that time, or does this indeed put them on a track where um, they, that are we turning something uh, loose that wouldn't have been available other than the residential part of it? And, I, and I'm not saying this just to, um, as Mr. Abel said, to be misdirecting, but I think it's important first to understand what the permit process is through the existing zoning and then what the permit process would be under the plan designation. So under the commercial zoning um, with the auto use qualifier, they, if they have a critical area permit, they would do that, and depending on, there may or may not be public notice. Um, other than that, it's a building permit. So there would be no public notice given for that development. 
Auto commercial does not require that. It would simply require approval of an administrative building permit. Under the plan designation, there would be um, two land use permits that would be needed if residential was a component of that, and that would be a multifamily design review as well as a plan development. And both of those are type two processes that do require um, public comment period, and this would most likely trigger a SEPA analysis as well. If there were no residential as a part of a proposal, it would still go through the plan permit process that would still require a public process. So under the plan, there's a public process that asks for comments um, before staff makes a decision under the existing zoning. There is no opportunity to provide public comment unless they're SEPA, but then they're providing on the merits of the SEPA. They're not necessarily providing comments on the design, the setbacks, those types of things. They would be looking at um, traffic impacts, potentially those things. So it's, it's a different process. So it sounds to me then that the, uh, even though they could do broader things, there are more uh, steps that they would have to go through to get to any one of them with, with the change. Yes, there is more process. Okay. And there's more opportunity for the public to comment. Sri, Steve, any, any questions for? Uh, one of the things what, when, when looking at these rezone proposals, you know, I think it's important to distinguish that we're talking about a, a, a property that's already zoned commercial. And it's hard to ignore, you know, the context of what is and what is there now and what, what may be. Uh, right now, this is a, a vacant piece of property. Um, so it, it's very hard to, you know, when you're talking about a reason, we're not talking about a specific project or a specific development. We're talking about what zoning is appropriate for this property. And, and the change being proposed is, uh, from commercial auto to commercial plan, so it's still a commercial zoned property. Um, obviously, the big the big change would be that residential uses would be permitted. So, you know, in our discussions, is is that uh, a use that's appropriate for this this area? Um, I'd love to hear more thoughts on that. Do, do I have to th thought about it right now? You can think about I, it have, right now. I have a question for Kathy. You you had a a comment about. Um, um, uh, conservation easement on on the creek. Um, if if we're already required to have a buffer from the creek, um, why would a conservation easement be instituted? What what? I guess my question is, what additional safety or public interest does that give? Um, well, again, that's really more of a project level um, discussion. Um, but just to, to answer the question, if they were not proposing to alter and to ask for buffer averaging or buffer reduction or anything of that nature, um, I believe, but I'm not certain the code would not require them to be to put it in a conservation easement, but we would certainly ask them to voluntarily do it, to voluntarily do it, because then that gives the public the opportunity to go in and possibly do some maintenance in that area and to do some enhancement, you know, should our crews go through and do these types of things. It's um, we just believe that we're better stewards of protecting the resources and it's just another measure. Okay, now I'm going to put on my, my stupid Norwegian hat and ask if under the, the conservation easement, uh, NC or some um, uh, volunteer organization is allowed on there, um, um, who holds the liability? If, and we, if something happens. And we discuss those things through the conservation easement. I mean, obviously, those are all legal documents that we work out when and if. There is no conservation easement, but it's something that we want to come do. Clearly, we contact the property owner. We ask them, and we discuss those liability issues. I mean, it's happening all over the city right now. There, there is nothing special about this property. Um, there's a portion of it that, um, well, as we've said, that it has already had some um, restoration done to it. And... But that, I mean, I'm not trying to not answer your question, but that's really more of a project level. What I was trying to do to respond to the public comment is that 
our critical area regulations address that issue and the resource will be protected um, and it's typical that we do do further protection if not required we ask for voluntary um, conservation easements okay okay now can i talk about your your thingy like we'd like <clears throat> um to me um it it seems that this property abutting the the transportation center um, is very likely to be, in fact, student housing, if, if not specifically designed for it. Um, it also seems to me that having residential multi as a buffer between the single family and the bus, or I mean the transportation uh, center is really uh, a, a good a good use of, of land and I think um, under the the planned designation uh, the city um, has a lot more um, um, power um, you know there there will be height limits limits on clearing um, uh, design um, review um, for for the buildings um, I suggest that this is probably um, a, a good move to, to um, rezone it uh, especially considering that the existing is planned auto and again just from my old Norwegian mind i i really couldn't see an auto lube place or a mcdonald's or a drive through bank or anything like that happening on a piece of property that's not on an arterial um, i think that the, the planned designation gives um, enough of oversight of both the site design and building design to um, to come up with a, a pretty reasonable project and if if I had anything to to do with it I would really be pushing for a direct connection between the transportation um, center and this uh, property in the uh, in in the form of uh, a trail or two um, uh, to um, kind of um, entice people to to uh, college kids to leave their their cars at home with their folks because they can just walk to the uh, to the bus stop and grab that that uh, shuttle bus to the campus which runs I don't remember how often but man that'd be that'd be pretty slick not having to worry but that's just my opinion Steve any other comments I'll save them for the discussion after the motion this is, this, oh, there's been no, no motion I would like to make a motion Make if there's no no other comments from the commission, yeah, I'd like to move that uh, to accept the findings of fact, conclusions, recommendations for the Samish uh, comp plan amendment and rezone be approved as submitted by the staff. We have a motion. Do we have a second. I'll second that. Discussion. My turn. <laughs> In reading all the, the, the written public comments and listening tonight, there seems to be a overriding theme that keeps coming up. Uh, renters, too many in units, uh, too many people in the area, garbage, traffic, drinking, college students, illegal parking, traffic. My first impression of this is that we have certain codes in this city 
that can take care of those things. I would hate to, to rezone a piece of property where code enforcement could take care of most of those problems. Now I know we haven't had any in this city. I feel that, I, that listening to some of the plans for code enforcement that are being developed at this time in relation to the, the, the rental program that's coming up, the ADA program, the subdivision program, I'm very confident that we are going to get tools in the neighborhood to take care of a lot of the problems that were expressed here from the public. I really don't wanna spank Peter to punish Paul because there are other means to go about solving the problems and, and I agree they're problems. I'll tell you what, I, 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 I've got a couple places across from me that they love to party. They're renters and every, Saturday, every day is a Saturday night to them. I don't know how they pass, but I guess they do. But I, I am thinking right now that I, I'm going to support the rezone and the, uh, the uh, comp plan amendment. I, th I think it's good for the area. Uh, for years, I was involved in auto and service station development and there is no way in a hundred years that that property would ever be developed as such. It doesn't have the traffic, it doesn't have the, uh, the location, and to have that still labeled as an auto uh, type of uh, zoning is, uh, is really a waste of time. And you can see by the last 30 years, nothing's happened there. So I am going to support the, uh, the motion. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Kathy, the way that we're moving at this point then would require commercial along with residential, is that correct? And you, do we need to make an amendment if, if we want to just uh, permit residential? That was going to be my clarifying question for Steve. I think as Steve is recommending his approval as the finding and facts as they are currently drafted, which does not include residential as an outright permitted use. or did your recommendation include residential as an outright permitted use? It does include residential, multifamily. Yes, but currently under plan commercial, it, I mean, under plan commercial, you have to also do another permitted use with the residential. You can't just do a standalone residential uses. So, for example, the building just up the street on Lincoln Street where all the commercial is vacant, it was a requirement to have commercial and residential in a mixed use development. Right. As opposed to Area 20, which is just immediately north of this where it's zone plan commercial, but it allows residential to be outright, which means you can build apartments without having to do a commercial use on the site. There's a very slight distinction as to the way that it reads, and I'm wanting to make sure um, that's clear. So specifically how it reads in the code right now is that apartments are permitted when in conjunction with other permitted uses. So this is on page 65 in the matrix, right. probably about starting the bottom two thirds. And you'll see the word apartments. I can actually put it on the overhead if that would be helpful. Yeah, I got, I got apartments in conjunction with other permitted uses. Right. Yes. So that means it has to have commercial. Right. So right here, by this designation, apartments in conjunction with other permitted uses, that means you can only do apartments if you have another permitted use. Now, that other permitted use could be any one of these listed under plan commercial. If you take the alternative recommendation that was proposed and similar to what's to the north in area 20 of Puget and also what is similar to the Planning Commission's recommendation on Samish Way, that was to allow apartments that were not required to be in conjunction with another permitted use. So it's a standalone allowed use. Yes. Okay. That's, that's what I intended. 
So if we clear on that, Heather, are we clear on that? The, the motion on the table is to support staff's recommendation, finding facts and conclusions, and allow residential uses as a permitted outright use. So these findings, facts, and conclusions and recommendation will need to be modified to include Correct. that. Okay. 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 We have a motion and a second. We've had some discussion. Any further discussion, comments? I have a, a, I have a, a comment on, um, you know, when, when I look at this, oftentimes I think the market, and, and, and Steve, you know, hit on this a little bit, kind of dictates what's appropriate and what's, en what's not. This has been zoned uh, commercial auto for, for quite some time and there's been no development on this. Um, you know, seeing that this property was, went to a rezone request 10 years ago, even 10 years ago they felt like the zoning wasn't appropriate. Um, I thought it was an interesting uh, uh, comment about the amount of rentals in the residential area, area three, just up the hill, how many residents, I think, you know, somebody said 36, 40 percent of rentals, you know, so those houses, single family homes are occupied by renters. And I think that market kind of tells the story too, that there's a demand for housing in this area and that that demand's not being met. Um, so that's my thoughts. So. So my question is, if we um, do this, can we s say that the um, that that, we, that we can we can uh, um, state a density along with allowing apartments outright? So maybe say I don't know, a thousand or fifteen hundred square feet per unit. Would, is, is that out of our purview? Um, definitely it's not out of your purview and staff actually had this discussion and the reason that we didn't um, bring forward a density propo proposal is because quite frankly the analysis that we did found that residential uses were warranted there, they made sense there, we want the density there because it is urban level of dwelling. I mean, of, of living, that's what needs to go there. So then the question that we had among staff is why limit it? If the development standards establish a box, a buildable area, then that's the area that could be utilized. So we did not propose any density because we felt our regulations already confined the development of the site. You certainly can do that. Um, it is within your, your purview. Um, I would say that um, there should be some analysis or some thought on that and unfortunately what I don't have for you but what we can find at least are what the surrounding densities are. So I would just offer that. Well, in, in, in my experience, uh, um, the parking requirements pretty much dictate the density. Um, but I was just wondering whether we should label it as a certain density. Phyllis? Well, actually, my thinking is kind of the other side of the coin is that, that with uh, the projection that the number of households in, this, in the city of Bellingham is going toward fewer numbers of people, then maybe what we should do is permit something that would be smaller to allow for the one and two person household rather than making it uh, necessary that we have to do a thousand square feet or whatever arbitrary number we might want to come up with. I would tend to agree with staff is let's see what's proposed, but there seems to be a, a real demand now for smaller units for instead of the college student, smaller units for um, one and two person households and 650 square feet or less even. This seems to be a trend. And I, I would agree with that. The thing that's really interesting about density is density defines the number of units, but it doesn't define the number of people who actually live there. And that's something that's really difficult to regulate because three bedrooms versus studios, you can have more studios and have less people than less units with three bedrooms. So the randomness of, of all the different, you know, makeups that you could have, um, market drives a lot of, of what people choose to do and they look at vacancy rates. I mean, it's, it's a very involved process from our understanding of what developers do before they make those decisions. That's a good comment. 
good discussion. Any uh, anything else from the commission? We have a motion on the table. We'll put it to a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 That's 5-0. Motion passes. Okay, at this uh, time we're going to close the public hearing and uh, of you who would wish to, Greg, any uh, new business, old business? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just a couple of things. Your next meeting is on March 26th and you'll be looking at the development of four commercial buildings totaling 61,000 square feet on uh, a site at 1240 West Baker View, which is in the vicinity of the new Costco. Um, and after that, you're about to get pretty busy. Uh, we have three meetings scheduled in April, including uh, a joint meeting with the planning committee of the city council. Uh, and that uh, meeting is on scheduled tentatively for April 23rd, your April 23rd meeting. So the council members are actually coming to your meeting rather than you having to go to theirs, which is nice. Um, and the subject of that meeting likely will be um, uh, the UGA question and where and how we're gonna accommodate growth and um, should we expand the UGA or should we infill uh, sort of the issues that we talked about at the open house on Tuesday night. And that's the 23rd? 23rd of April. What, what happened to the uh, accessory we, dr yeah, uh, dwelling we units? We haven't been able to um, schedule a joint meeting on that topic. Okay. It's a little different, Steve, because um, the, the comprehensive plan obviously is a legislative action. It's, it, it is citywide. Um, with the ADU ordinance, we're actually talking about regulations and so there's a question about whether or not the council should be involved early in discussions about regulations when ultimately they make the decision. So there's a little bit of a distinction there. We're still working through that. Okay. Uh, oh, excuse me. What kind of materials can you get us on the UGA prior to that meeting? We, uh, will, pre get, we will get you a summary of all of the contact that we've had with the public. So the survey results. Um, the comments that we got from the open house, um, we, those are on the website. Uh, we've been out meeting with neighborhoods. We'll summarize all of that input for you. Um, and we will also sort of reintroduce you to um, the, the population growth forecast that we're working with um, and the ramifications of that and the options that are available to us. Um, we won't be asking you to make any decisions or recommendations on the 23rd. It's an introduction to the topic and a chance for you to talk with council members about it. Greg, can you uh, confirm the meeting dates in April for us? 16, 23, and 30. So not the 9th. So not the 9th. Not the 9th. And not the 2nd. Not the 2nd. Okay, 16, 23, and 30. Yes. 16 will be a continuation of the subdivision ordinance, and then 23 and 30 are the comp plan issues that we just talked about. And that's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay, meeting adjourned.